Lord, we love you, Lord. We are always grateful, Lord, to gather together, Lord, in your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for who you are, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we have your word. Lord, we've been, we've been talking about this in our men's study. Uh, Lord, just the preciousness of your word, the uniqueness of your word, Lord. There's nothing like it. And I pray, Lord, we would all have that desire, regardless of how old we are, regardless of how many years we've been serving you, to never stop learning, to never stop growing, to want to know your word, to be like a sponge, a spiritual sponge that absorbs it all, that takes it in because we need it all. And we recognize that all of it is has been written down for our instruction, for our learning, for our spiritual growth. And so, Lord, as we begin a brand new book tonight, Lord, as we kick off, I pray, Lord, stir our hearts. Lord, help us to be excited. I pray that we would be grateful, Lord, that we have your word in the first place. And I pray, Lord God, that it would be your spirit that speaks, that you would open up our hearts and give us that spiritual understanding, Lord God, that every time we gather together, we would leave this place having heard from our God, having understood what you desired us to learn. Lord, we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Good evening. Good evening. If you're not already there, let's turn our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 1 tonight. Ezekiel chapter 1. Okay. Give you guys a few seconds to turn there. Ezekiel chapter 1. We're going to cover the whole chapter tonight. There's 28 verses if you want to write that down. Ezekiel 1 verses 1 through 28. Now, We've just covered this last year. We went through the book of Jeremiah and the book of Lamentations, okay? And so we have already covered, essentially, the background of the book. And I know most of us were, were, were here, and so you're already pretty familiar with the setting. But just to make sure that we're all on that same page, I'm going to back up just for a few minutes and describe what had just taken place that leads us right into the book of Ezekiel that we're about to cover. Now, very quickly, in the year 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrian Empire. You might remember that originally there were 12 united tribes in what was known as the nation of, of Israel. But then after the time of Solomon and his son Rehoboam, the nation was divided, split into half. There were 10 tribes in the northern kingdom and then two tribes in what was known as the southern kingdom of Judah. Now the, the northern kingdom was, was wicked. It was ungodly. They always had nothing but ungodly kings. And for that reason, although God had sent Elijah and Elisha and other prophets to call them back to him, the people never responded. And so eventually God allowed the Assyrian Empire in the year 722 BC to completely wipe out the northern kingdom and to haul back the survivors back to Assyria, never to return. And that's why even today they're referred to as the Lost Ten Tribes. But what happened after that? Well, God in his mercy desired that his children in the southern kingdom, the two tribes, that they would not suffer the same consequences as their brothers and sisters in the north, God desires, just like he does for us, right, that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance, right? God wants us to learn, and he wants us to learn from the example, even of those that fall and suffer the consequences of their sin around us. And so, what did God do? Well, God did a couple of things. One of the big things that God did is that in the year 640 BC, a young man named Josiah, began to reign as king of Judah. Now understand, Josiah had a ungodly father and grandfather. But at eight years old, this young man became king of the southern kingdom. At 16 years old, the Bible records that he began to seek the Lord. God called him, God stirred his heart, God raised him up, and he began to call upon the name of the Lord. At 20 years old, he began instituting spiritual reforms in the land. As he began to remove all idolatry and false idol worship, which his father and grandfather practiced, and he began to lead the people back to serve God. Now, it was also during that time that God raised up a young man by the name of Jeremiah. 
And this is where Jeremiah, if you remember, came in. Jeremiah prophesied at the same time that King Josiah, who was the last godly king of Judah, was on the throne. And both of them together, right, prophet and king, were calling the people to turn from their sin, to serve God. And the people did, at least outwardly. They went through the motions, we would say. Religiously, they did what their king commanded them to do. But in the year 609 BC, King Josiah died. And when he died, what happened? the people quickly turned back away from the Lord. And it was so sad. Jeremiah was now on his own. And he continued to call the people to repent, to call the people back to God, but no one listened. And the last four kings of Judah were all ungodly. They were all wicked men who opposed Jeremiah. Now, We read how after the Babylonians defeated the Assyrians to become the New World Order, to demonstrate their power over the southern kingdom of Judah, led by King Nebuchadnezzar, they began to exert control over Judah. And King Nebuchadnezzar did two things. Number one, he installed the person who would rule, a puppet king who would do his bidding. He installed a couple of those ungodly kings, but also he began deportations. He began to take the Jews from Jerusalem and haul them back to Babylon to serve him. And this happened three times. Now, the first time it happened was in the year 605 B.C., When that happened, the first group that was deported back to Babylon were the nobility, were the royalty. And in that group of exiles was Daniel. And we know this from the book of Daniel. Daniel, his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and (laughs) Abonigas. Close enough? Just want to see if you guys are paying attention, okay? That was the first deportation. The second deportation took place in the year 597 BC. We would say nine years later. The second deportation, the king was taken. King Jehoiakim was taken along with his family, along with 10,000 of the leading citizens of Jerusalem and the gold and the silver that was a part of the temple. In that second deportation, a man by the name of Ezekiel was taken back to Babylon. Now, we know because we studied the book of of Jeremiah and we know history that there would eventually be a third deportation, right? We know that. We've covered this already. In the year 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar returns for the third time. He's through with them, he's through with their rebellion. His army of Babylonians destroys the city of Jerusalem, burns down the palace, the temple, all the city residences, knocks down the walls of Jerusalem, and takes the remainder of the people back to Babylon, leaving only the poorest of the poor to work the land for Babylon. Now the reason this is important to understand is we know what happened. But the book of Ezekiel begins between the second deportation and the third. In other words, the book of Ezekiel is all about Ezekiel and the exiles that had already already been taken to Babylon. What we're about to read is the ministry of Ezekiel to the captives, to those, again, that were already in captivity. Let me give you some more background. Here's where it gets interesting. According to Jeremiah chapter 29, and we already read this before, God led Jeremiah to send a letter to the captives, a letter that was delivered to those living in captivity. And in this letter, Jeremiah called upon the Jewish people that were already in exile, telling them They would be there for how how long? You guys remember? 
70 years, okay? They would be there 70 years until the judgment of God upon Israel was complete. And the reason that this was important is because Jeremiah was basically telling them, you are not going to avoid the consequences. You are going to suffer the judgment of your sins, right? Thank God he spared you. But understand, you're not going anywhere. You are going to do your time. And so you might as well settle down. You might as well have children, raise a family, because you're not going anywhere. Just serve God. And Jeremiah told them, you should pray for the leaders of Babylon. And I love that, and I think that's so important, right? Because regardless, if we agree with our governing leaders, they need prayer. Isn't that right? We should be praying for them. And that's exactly what Jeremiah told them. But what made this so interesting is that just like today, Just like today, people don't want to believe that they have to pay the consequences of their sin. People don't want to believe, right, that they have to face the judgment of God. And so what do they do? The same thing people do today. They turn to other people, and they turn specifically to false prophets. Jeremiah told them, you're going to do your time, you're going to pay the consequences of your sin, They didn't want to believe that. So instead, they turned to false prophets who told them, don't worry. Egypt is going to conquer Babylon, and Egypt is going to set us free. And we're all going to go back home. Now, this was completely, right, polar opposite to what God said was going to take place. But that's what the people wanted to believe. And they ate up this false hope that they were given. And so what did God do? Okay, The people had rejected the letter that Jeremiah sent them. So what did God do? God raised up Ezekiel. He is now in Babylon with those people. And as Jeremiah is calling upon the people in Jerusalem at this time to turn to God, right? Because destruction was on its way. Ezekiel would be raised up to tell those in Babylon, stop believing in false hope. Stop thinking you're going to escape the judgment, right? Jerusalem is going to be completely destroyed. You're not going back home. Your best bet is to settle down, is to make the best of your life the way it is, and to recognize, right, that no one is going to escape the consequences of their sin. This is the setting for our book, okay? This is the setting that kicks us off, right? Kicks us off to the calling of Ezekiel as he will begin to speak to the people that were living in exile with him. That's the background. Okay, as I always do, as I always do, whenever we begin a brand new book and there's information that I want you to keep in the back of your mind that we might not cover or that's not covered already in the book, I give you some facts. And so if you're taking notes, this specifically is for you. Number one, the author of the book is the prophet Ezekiel, okay? Whose name means God strengthens or strengthened by God. And this is very important. We'll talk about this later. Number two, Ezekiel was born in the year 622 B.C., while Josiah, the last godly king of Judah, was on the throne. And so uh, Ezekiel was a young man. He was a young boy at the end of Josiah's life, but at least he was raised at the end of the, the, the godly kingdom that existed under Josiah. Number three, Ezekiel was from the tribe of Levi, which means that his dad was a priest, and Ezekiel would have likewise been raised to one day be a priest. Number four, Ezekiel will minister, as we will cover, for 22 years in Babylon. Ezekiel prophesied, as I already mentioned, alongside Jeremiah, who was about 20 years older than him, and alongside Daniel, who was about the same age. Now, Daniel is also in Babylon, although they're not in the same place. Daniel, we know, is in the palace where Ezekiel, as we're about to find out, is living in the outskirts. Ezekiel was 23 years old when he was married. We'll talk about this later. 
At 25, he and his wife were taken captive to Babylon. And then at 30 years old is when he was called by God to be a prophet. Rabbinical tradition holds that after rebuking an Israelite prince in Babylon for his idolatry, Ezekiel would later be killed in the year 560 BC at 62 years old. And so this is information that, again, we will not find in the book, but it's covered in different places. Uh, And as you piece it all together, again, you recognize that this is what it is. And the last thing, very importantly, the theme of the book. Okay? The theme of the book is the glory of God. And we're going to talk about that again all throughout the next several months. The glory of God as God reveals his glory, not only to Ezekiel again, but to the rest of the captives in Babylon. Tonight, if you're taking notes again, we're going to look at the introduction to Ezekiel. We're going to cover the 28 verses in chapter 1. We're going to read about Ezekiel's preparation to be a prophet of God. We're going to see how God prepared him for the work of ministry. And the first thing we'll begin reading about is the call of Ezekiel. So let's begin tonight, chapter 1, verse 1, the book of Ezekiel. We're going to look at the call as it reads, In the 13th year, 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Chebar Canal, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Now here we have Ezekiel beginning his book. And he cites for us an event that took place in the 30th year when he saw the visions of God. Now scholars believe the 30th year refers to his age. On his 30th year or in his 30th year. Now the reason they believe this is because, as I mentioned, Ezekiel was raised to be a priest. And priests would begin their uh, temple service on their 30th year. We find this in Numbers chapter 4, verse 3. And so it's interesting that although Ezekiel was no longer able to be a priest and to work in the temple because he was taken into captivity. God still had a role for him to play. So at the same time he would have begun his temple service, God called him. God spoke to him. God revealed himself to him by way of the heavens being opened and revealing to Ezekiel visions of of God. Now what I love about this, and I think this is so comforting, if we were to go around the room and I was to ask the questions, how many of you thought at at a teenager that one day you would be doing this, or one day you would be doing that, right? At 12 years old, you could have asked me what I thought I would be doing, and I would have told you at 12 years old, because my mind was already made up, that I was going to be a lawyer. That was on my to-do list. That's everything that I knew and believed I, I wanted to do. But I wasn't able to do that. My life changed, right? Through different decisions that took place, that did not happen. But does that mean that God could not use my life in a different capacity? We know that, right? And I think this is so beautiful, so comforting. Ezekiel could have been discouraged and bummed out like, wow, God, you allowed me to take, uh, be taken into Babylon. I guess I'm not able to fulfill you know, what I thought I was going to do with the rest of my life, but, but God shows us that that's not true because it doesn't matter where we are. It doesn't matter where God might allow us to be. God still has a purpose for our life. And God can use us wherever he has us, right? If we are open and available for God to be used. And that really encouraged me. I hope that encourages you as well. Now notice this. Notice that along with Ezekiel giving us his age, he reveals to us where he was. Look back at at the location. He was among the exiles by the Chebar Canal. Now, The Kibar Canal, as it's known today, is a canal that flows, uh, where the river Euphrates flows into. 
the river Euphrates comes alongside Babylon and it flows down southwest into the Kibar Canal. Now the reason this location is important is because some years later, a psalm would be written about the exiles by this location. And we find this, you don't have to turn there, in Psalm 137, it says this, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. This is the exiles. These are those that had been taken captive. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion, when we remembered Jerusalem. And I want you to imagine for, the, uh, for a second, right, these people that had been stolen, we would say, from their home, taken captive, right? Not voluntarily, right? Against their will, taken 700 miles away to a foreign land, to a place they did not want to be. And day after day, they were hopeless and they were broken. And what would they do? They would come to the river and it was there that they would pray as they would weep, as they would cry, as they would remember Jerusalem, as they would remember the place they were raised and the place that they loved. It goes on, verse two, there on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Now, the psalm is so sad, right? It's so terrible when you, you recognize what they were going through, when you recognize their, their broken and, and hopelessness. And you wonder, day after day, right? Literally, as the years went by, if in their brokenness they began to think to themselves, I wonder if we're ever going home. I wonder, I, I wonder if, if this is it. I wonder if we're ever going to be free again. Now remember, these are the chosen people of God, right? These are the Israelites. They knew who God was. They knew the power of God. They knew the stories of God's deliverance. And yet day after day and month after month and year after year, nothing. An ungodly king reigned over them. And they were hopeless. And they were miserable. And again, just like us today, when we find ourselves broken and and in circumstances that are beyond our control, how many of us begin to wonder, God, do you you see what's going on with me? God, do you you understand what I'm going through? God, do 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 you know what I'm feeling? And they began to wonder, God, have you given up on me? God, have you abandoned me? And you wonder, Every time they heard about Nebuchadnezzar conquering another nation and Nebuchadnezzar growing in power, you wonder if they began to wonder, God, are you still on the throne? God, are you still in control? Are you, are you still able to do as, as you once did? This is how they were feeling again in their brokenness until one day, this day. Because as they were praying, look back at the verse, right? As they were praying in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as we were together, the exiles by the Chebar River, where they would gather together to weep and to pray, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Now, to me, this is so powerful and I love this, right? If I were to ask you the question, how many of you desire for God to do something special. Can you say amen to that, right? I, I do, I, I, want, I want to see God. One of my prayers that I pray a lot, and God probably gets tired of hearing me say this, right, is this. God, show me your fingerprints. I pray that a lot. God, show me your fingerprints. And God knows what I mean by that. I, I want to be able to see where, where he's at work. I, I want to be able to see where he's been moving, where he's been working. And so I pray, God, do something, do something. I want to see it, God, show me. I know you can. And I often pray that because I want to see God do something special. And what I love about this is, is understand to them, even to Ezekiel, this was just another day, wasn't it? It was just another day. It was just another prayer meeting. 
Because they probably did this over and over and over again. But it was this day, for God's reason, according to God's timing, that God decided to do something. And I love that because that kind of teaches us something, right? You never know when God's going to do something. You never know. And I think about that, right? You never know when God's going to do something crazy in a, in a service. You never know when God's going to do something in a Bible study, right? You never know when God's going to do something in a prayer meeting. And so what does that tell us? We better not miss it. We better be there, right? I want to be there. How sad, right? You're like, that was the day you felt like staying home. And then you heard God did something awesome. You heard God did something out of this world because that's exactly what took place. It was on that day. They didn't know. God didn't announce it. But it was that day as they continued to meet there, as they continued to seek the Lord in prayer, that it was that day that God chose to do something. Lord, help us, right, to, to desire God to do something in our lives. Lord, help us to have excited hearts that we would come to church every time, that we would open up our Bibles in devotion, believing that God's going to speak to us, that God's going to show up, that God is going to do something. Someone say amen to that, right? I think that's so important. Look at verse 2. On the fifth day of the month, now that's, he already said that, right? On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim. Notice, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans, the land of the Babylonians, by the Chebar Canal, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Now, this is interesting. We're given the timeline. We're given the setting. This happened how long? Five years after the deportation. Now, this tells us something. This tells us that God waited for his reasons to act. Now, I have to believe that wasn't their first prayer meeting. I bet this went on for years. I bet those prayer meetings went on day after day for years. And then one day God decided to show up, we would say, right? God desired to speak specifically through uh, or to Ezekiel through visions. Now notice again what it says. That the hand of the Lord was upon Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord, I'm sorry, let me back up. It says first that the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. Now I love this because I believe that God speaks. Doesn't he? Does God speak? We know primarily God speaks through his word, amen? But I believe that God speaks as we spend time with him in prayer, as God touches our heart, as God speaks to us, as God leads us. Because that's what happened. They were praying. I believe Ezekiel was praying. That's what they did by the river. And as they were praying, God spoke. And God began to speak to Ezekiel's heart. Notice, right? The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel through visions. Then, or also, the hand of the Lord was upon Ezekiel. What does this mean? This means that God laid a hold of him. I love this. We would say that God called Ezekiel. Ezekiel, I'm calling you. And it's that picture of God literally grabbing hold of Ezekiel for a reason, for a purpose. We know specifically for the work of ministry. But the beauty in this, right, is that, get this, it is the word of God that brings illumination. It is the hand of God that brings enablement. Enablement. Because that's what happened here. How many of you understand that God will never call you to do something without first equipping you with the ability to do it? God's always going to provide. He's always going to give you what you need in order to get the job done. First, he gave, he spoke through his word, right? A message through the visions. And then he laid hold of Ezekiel. We would say God put his hands on Ezekiel, enabling him. 
strengthening him for the work of ministry. Now, let me ask you again, if you were paying attention, what does the name Ezekiel mean? God strengthens. God strengthens. This is where we see all of this come together. And so, in the first three verses, we are told or given a summary on what happened on that day. They met by the river. Five years after they had already been there, on that day, God showed up. God spoke his word through visions to Ezekiel as he laid a hold of him, strengthening him for the work that he was calling him to do. And so, what happens next? Well, as we continue on, Ezekiel will now reveal to us details of the visions that God gave him. And that's the second thing tonight. Number one was the call of Ezekiel. Number two are the visions of glory, okay? The visions of glory. And we're going to get into some crazy stuff um, as we began reading verse four. Notice, as I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north. And if you have a pen, underline north. That's very important. A windstorm came out of the north. And a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually. And in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming or molten metal. Now, how many of you have ever um, maybe been to Texas? And in Texas, you saw an electrical storm coming. Anyone ever seen that before? I remember years ago as I used to travel uh, uh, in my uh, different job before I became a pastor, I would travel. I spent a lot of time in Texas, and I remember when they had a massive thunderstorm that came through, and I was at a hotel, and all the sirens went off, and everyone had to get to the basement of the hotel because things were so bad, but what was interesting is the, the hotel that I was staying at had an open courtyard, and so the center of the hotel had no roof. And so when everybody's down there and we're kind of trying to watch the news and you know everyone's kind of freaked out and it's raining and hailing and all this crazy stuff, in my curiosity, I, I thought, I gotta go see what this looks like. And so I kind of left the basement, right, where everybody, we had food, everything down there. And I went up and I kind of went out and I didn't go into the courtyard, but I opened the door and kind of did one of these things. And it was like the Wizard of Oz. I mean, if you've never seen anything like that, it was incredible. One of the most incredible, you know, it looked like the 4th of July, you know, on steroids, you know, something with rain and clouds and hail and lightning. And I mean, it was, it was amazing. It was scary, but it was amazing. And as I read this again, that's exactly the type of thing that Ezekiel is describing. This is what he saw in a vision. An electrical storm, a storm cloud, a whirlwind, a hurricane, whatever words that you want to use, a great cloud that was, that was headed his way coming out of the north. Now, you might also remember, if you know your Old Testament, Genesis chapter, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 19, God's presence coming down upon Mount Sinai. Do we remember that? Have we at least seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, right? You guys remember that? A massive cloud covers the top of Mount Sinai where Moses went up with the burning bush and fire and brightness and lightning and you imagine maybe rain, right? Thunder, all of that was taking place again, which is a similar picture of what Ezekiel saw. And just as All that took place on the top of Mount Sinai took place because God's presence was there. What Ezekiel saw also was the presence of God coming his way. The presence of God coming his way. But the key thing, and I asked you to underline, is that God's presence was coming from out of the north. Now, why was that significant? Well, let me remind you of something. But way back, Jeremiah 1, 14 and 15. 
Jeremiah writes, then the Lord said to me, out of the north, disaster shall be let loose upon all the inhabitants of the land. This was the word that Jeremiah had received at the very beginning of his ministry before any of the deportations had ever taken place, before Babylon had even come the first time. And yet, God told Jeremiah to tell the children of Israel in Judah and Jerusalem that their enemies would come down from the north and they would destroy them. For behold, this is God speaking, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north, declares the Lord, they shall come and everyone shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against all its walls and all around and all and against all the cities of Judah. This was the judgment of God. This was God's decree to Jeremiah that because the children of Israel refused to turn from their sin and turn back to God, that God's judgment was coming. And God had already chosen Babylon to destroy the southern kingdom in the same way that God had chosen Assyria to destroy the northern kingdom. Now, what's incredible about this, remember, Jerusalem has not been destroyed yet, not at the time of Ezekiel's vision. Second deportation has happened, but the city is standing, the palace is standing, the temple is standing, the walls are standing. Jerusalem hasn't been destroyed yet. And yet, this was God's warning. The people did not believe that was going to happen. The false prophets were saying, no, Egypt's going to come. Egypt's going to destroy Babylon. We're going to be set free, and we're going back home, and everything is going to go back to normal. And God says no. God speaks to Ezekiel to remind him, no, judgment is coming. The wages of sin is, is death. My consequences are I, I am bringing upon the people for their failure to turn from their sin and turn to me. And this is what Ezekiel saw. He saw the presence of God. He saw God coming to bring the final judgment that he declared he would ultimately bring way back, decades earlier, the message that he gave to Jeremiah. Interesting. Many of you know this verse. According to Hebrews 12, 29, the Bible says that our God is a consuming fire. And that's why, again, when God appeared in his presence on Mount Sinai, there was fire. And in the same way, look back at what he says. Ezekiel says he saw like molten metal, like metal, weapons of judgment being on fire because judgment was on its way. But keep reading, verse 5. And from the midst of it, from the midst of this cloud, came the likeness of four living creatures. Interesting. Four living creatures. Now, when we get to chapter 10, Ezekiel is going to refer to the same creatures as cherubim. And so we know from Ezekiel chapter 10 that the living creatures, the four living creatures he is talking about are angels. Specific angels referred to as cherubim. Who were these special angels? These were angels with unique power that surrounded the throne of God. Now, what's really interesting, I want you to notice in your Bible the word likeness. That's important. The word likeness is important because Ezekiel is going to use the word likeness or like 25 times throughout the rest of the chapter. 25 times. Talk about repeating himself. Now the reason Ezekiel is going to do this is because he's about to describe everything that he saw in the vision. And he's having a hard time describing what he saw. He's having a hard time making sense of what he saw. And so over and over again, he's, he's trying to describe for us that it was like this or like that because, again, it is so hard for him to comprehend, and he's doing his best to help his readers comprehend what he saw as well. So take note of the word like or likeness. We'll keep reading. 
And this was their appearance. He begins describing these cherubim. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. And the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. Again, Ezekiel's doing his best. He has seen something he's never seen before, something no doubt is out of this world, and he's doing his best to describe for us what it was like. And he begins by telling us that they, they had a human likeness. They, they kind of look like men, but they had four faces, and they had four wings, and the, the bottom of their feet were like calf, were like a calf, and they shine like polished brass. Interesting, right? Something unlike we've ever seen before. But then he says something very important. These angels had their faces and their wings thus. They had them looking forward, and they had their wings stretched out, notice, so that each of them, each of their wings touched one another. I want you to imagine for a second, because this will be helpful for you. If there was one facing me, and I'm facing the other one, and then you have one facing this way, and you have one facing this way, so that as they stretched out their wings, all of their wings touched as they formed a square. Does that make sense? Okay? Very, very important, because this is what he saw. He also note that they were moving right? They were moving with the cloud, but they never turned their face. And so although they were moving forward, they never turned. They were able to move forward without turning. And this is interesting because they're looking at something, or as we'll find out, they're looking at someone. And they do not turn their face from him, but yet they're able to move forward without turning at all. Very interesting. Now, what's funny about this to me is how many of us have pictures of angels or statues of angels at home, right? We kind of talked a little bit about this on Sunday. Any of the pictures you have look like this? No? Pictures we have always look like what? Cupid? Babies, right? Real soft and nice cuddly or something like that, right? But no, whenever you read about angels in the Bible, they look nothing like babies, guys. They're kind of scary looking. They're kind of terrifying. Now understand, these are guardians, aren't they? And these specific angels are guarding something or someone. That's why their eyes are focused. That's why they're moving, because God's leading them, as we're about to see. But they do not take their face off of God. And yet, they are powerful. They have wings, right? They're no doubt fast. But they look nothing like the angels, again, that so many people think angels look like today. Keep reading verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an angel. Such were the faces. And their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another angel, while the other two wings covered their bodies. Now, this is interesting. Again, Ezekiel's doing his best. And he looks and he notices that each of the four angels who had four different faces, their faces were a face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an 
eagle, okay? Really, really interesting. The face of an eagle. Now, what, why, right? What is this about? What does this mean? Well, most scholars believe that the reason for this is the fact that all of creation, of course, having been created by God, is subordinate to the throne of God. How many of you know that God on his throne reigns above all, okay? As the creator of all, he reigns above all. And these four creatures are very unique because man, for instance, is the highest creature that God created, right? We were made in the likeness of God. The lion is the greatest of the wild animals, right? The greatest of the... Of the, uh, of, of the animals of the wild kingdom. He's the king of the jungle. He dominates. The ox is the strongest of the domesticated animals, the most powerful working animal. And the eagle is the, the king of the skies, right? It's the greatest of the flying animals. And so each one of these creatures, we would say, is the greatest of their kind. The greatest of those they represent. The eagle represents all birds, of course, right? The lion, all wild animals. The ox, the strongest of the domesticated animals. And, of course, man being the highest creature that God created overall. Now, some scholars believe that's what this refers to, stating that because all of these four of the greatest uh, creatures are subordinate to God, serve God, that every other creature behind them or lower than them also serves God. And so that could be one of the reasons. Another scholar or many other scholars believe that these four faces represent the fact that these angels have intelligence like man, power like lions, they serve like an ox, and they are swift with speed like an eagle. And so Maybe it's that, maybe it's the first thing. Again, we don't know for sure, but it's very, very interesting, and we're not even told why it is the way it is. And so again, it might be one of these things, but keep reading, verse 12. Each went straight forward. Wherever the Spirit would go, they went, without turning as they went. And for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning, and the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now Ezekiel tells us that these things are fast, and these things are on the move, okay? They're together. Notice, they're not moving. They're focused. They don't turn their head, but they are moving, and they are moving fast. And he takes the time to explain to us that they do not deviate. Wherever the Spirit tells them to go, what Spirit? The Holy Spirit. Wherever the Spirit of God directs them to go, they go. They don't go to the left. They don't go to the right. They don't mess around. They don't get sidetracked. They go exactly where the Spirit leads them to go. And whenever we read about God, whenever we hear about the call of a believer, how many of you know we're called to go straight? We're called to always move forward, right? Not to the left, not to the right, not to go back. We're always to be moving forward because that's what God's about. Always moving forward, always going straight and not deviating and get sidetracked to the left or the right. And that's what they were doing. Verse 15. Now, as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a will on the earth beside the living creatures. One will for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wills and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of barrels. And the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being as it were a will within a will. When they went, they went in any of their four directions without turning as they went. And the rims were tall and awesome. And the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wills went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wills rose. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, and the wills rose along with them. 
For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wills. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those rose from the earth, the wills rose along with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wills. Now again, your heart has to go out to Ezekiel, right? Here is a man living 2,500 years ago. And he has to describe something that we've never seen today, 2,500 years later. And yet, he's doing his best. And he is describing what we would call today a giant four-wheeled chariot. That's what this is. A giant four-wheeled chariot that was carrying the throne of God. And he describes these massive wheels that were controlled by each one of the angels. And within every giant wheel was another wheel, a wheel within a wheel, which enabled the wheels to be able to move and turn in any direction. They could go anywhere in any direction that the Spirit of God led them to go. And they were fast. This is really interesting. This is really interesting. This tells us something, it shows us something, that these angels were on the move. Would that make sense? And they were moving fast. And they were carrying with them a chariot. That's what they were moving. And they were moving again wherever God led them to go. Now it says here that the, notice, right, the rims of all four were full of eyes around. Now, what does that mean? Full of eyes around. Now, again, I think this is interesting. How many cars do we have today that they have cameras all around? And why are they there? So that they could see everything around them, right? Interesting. And I believe that's what this speaks of. As God is able to see everything, as everything around them is able to be seen, is able to be looked at so that they are aware of everything taking place around them and around the chariot that they were carrying. Verse 22. Over the heads of the living creatures, there was the likeness of an expanse, shining like an awe-inspiring crystal spread out above their heads. And under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one toward another, and each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of, of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings, and there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads, And when they stood still, they let down their wings. Now again, he's doing his best, right? He sees the angels, and under the angels, there's wills that the angels are are controlling. But then he says, on top of the angels was an expanse, this large space, this, this huge platform, we would call it, made of crystal, like a sea of glass. And that's what what they were carrying. This large area, this large platform, which we'll find out the throne of God sits upon. Now, I love this because over and over again, he's trying to tell us something. He's trying to tell us that God is on the move. He's trying to tell us that God is at work amongst his people on the earth. How many of you believe that today, right? Our God is active And this is the message, again, he wants them to understand. And he's talking about how incredible it was and how it sounded. It sounded like water crashing, right? Rushing water like Niagara Falls. It sounds like an incredible army on the march because God is on the move. And it wasn't until that they came to a stop that he heard the voice of someone speaking from above the platform. Verse 26, and above the expanse, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was the likeness with a human appearance. 
And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him. Verse 28, like the appearance of the rainbow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so also was the appearance of the brightness all around. Now again, he tells us, right, that as he was able to now look and see above that expanse, that platform, he saw what looked like a throne. And on the throne, as beautiful it was, was someone who sat upon the throne who, who had like the appearance of a man. Now this is really, really interesting. Who was seated on the throne? We know who was seated on the throne. Now, we know that man was made in the image of God. And although the Bible says that God is spirit so that he does not have bodily form, something about his appearance caused Ezekiel to recognize that it was like a man, which explains again how we were made in the appearance or image of God. And so here you see Ezekiel putting it all together, recognizing this was the presence of God, this was the glory of God, that God was being moved and carried by his angels who operated these massive wheels that were fast like lightning, and they were carrying God who sat upon the throne. Now what's so beautiful about this, if you want to do some homework later, is if we had time, I could take you to Revelation chapter 4. Because in Revelation chapter 4, the Apostle John, remember, is caught up in a vision to heaven, and he sees this very thing. He sees the sea of glass, he sees the throne of God, he sees the one who sits on the throne, he sees the very same thing. But Ezekiel here, he saw it first. And he recognized again, as he saw this, that it was God revealing his glory to him and showing him that he is on the move. And so how did Ezekiel respond? This is our last thing. The response. The response of Ezekiel. Last verse. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, Ezekiel says, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. Now again, I love this, and I love the attitude, and to me it makes so much sense that if you saw this, you would fall on your face too, right? It's exactly what happened. He was humbled. And in humble surrender, he falls on his face before the glory of God. Now I want to make something clear, and we're almost done. Ezekiel did not see God. How do we know that? Well, because no man can see God and, and live, but he's seen the glory of God. God revealed to him again his glory. And the reason he did this is because God was calling Ezekiel for a task. And he would be opposed and he's going to be resisted and he's going to be all alone as he preaches this message over the next 22 years that God was giving him. But seeing the glory of God would strengthen him, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that strengthen you? It would prepare him. It would ready him for the task ahead. The people did not want to believe that judgment was coming. They believed they were going to get away with with the consequences of their sin. They were believing the false prophets. But Ezekiel was going to tell them that's not true. God made a promise. God was on his way. Judgment was going to come. The Babylonians were going to come to Jerusalem and destroy it, right? And the rest of the people would be brought into Babylon with them where they would stay again for the next 70 years. But for anyone during that time who might question, God, are you still on the throne? 
in the midst of their suffering and their struggles and, and, and their hopelessness, if they wondered, God, are you still there? God, are you still able to help God? Do you still love us? What could Ezekiel tell them? Yeah, he's on the throne. I've seen him. He's on the move. He hasn't forgot about us, right? He's not too far away, but God is active and he is going to do what he's going to do. Ezekiel will eventually tell them, yes, one day God's people will return back to Jerusalem. But that will not take place until God has his way and God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen? All right. Let's pray tonight. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we love you, Lord. We thank you tonight for your goodness. Oh, thank you, Lord God. Very interesting chapter, Lord. But Lord, I believe it sets the tone, Lord. It sets our hearts and prepares us for what's next, for what we're about to read over the next several weeks and even months, Lord God, as we cover such an incredible book. But I pray tonight, Lord God, we would understand, as Ezekiel did, that you're on the throne that there's no one like you, that you are powerful, that you are moving, that you are accomplishing your purpose, purposes and fulfilling your will, Lord God, because no one can do what you can do. Because despite, Lord God, the failures and the things that man does, Lord God, you're greater than all these things. Lord, your will is gonna be done. Lord, you're gonna have your way. And I pray, Lord, we would understand that that is the case, so that instead of fighting against you, so that instead of, of trying to, to oppose you, that we would recognize that there's only one God, it's not us. And so we might as well, Lord, surrender to you and join you, Lord God, so that we can receive your blessings instead of the consequences of rebellion. We, Lord, we love you, we thank you, we ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up.